The Department of Conservation in New Zealand is the government agency responsible for looking after New Zealand's cultural and historical heritage. They're in charge of about 30% of New Zealand's land area, or about 8 million hectares, and this includes native forests, tussock lands, alpine areas, wetlands, dune lands, etc. So it's a really, really big area across New Zealand. Now, I was interested in looking at how we could use spatial information to help the department and stakeholders understand more about the recreation opportunities available across New Zealand and how we manage those as a government department as well. And so we were using the framework for the recreation opportunity spectrum. Now, the Recreation Opportunity Spectrum, or ROS, was initially developed by the United States Forest Service, and it was their plan to be able to manage their land in this way. And really, it's all about how we zone different types of activities and infrastructure across New Zealand to, to look at being able to explain the types of opportunities that people have available to them, but also in a management sense to sort of understand where those opportunities are, what we're, be, what we're providing, and being able to describe them a little bit better as well. This enables us to be able to track these over time and also to plan for areas where we may want to put in new opportunities or perhaps reduce access to others as well. So let's just jump right in and have a look at the characteristics of the ROS zones. So really, we're all about just trying to think about how people use them, the, the availability of use, what the development is in the areas that, that you're using as well, what sort of risk you might encounter when you're there, how accessible areas are, and the noise level available as well. So just if we have a look at this conceptual diagram here, we've got those different characteristics along the x-axis and then on the y-axis, we've got from low, medium and high. So just a really broad characterization of these zones. So if we look at front country being one of the most accessible areas, that these are the sorts of opportunities. If you think you might just go to a car park and maybe you just jump off that car park and go for a little walk along something which is paved and maybe you see a waterfall or something like that. And so these are areas that are used quite a lot. So they have medium to high levels of usage and, and they're also quite highly developed. So this might mean that there's bridges, there's pathways, there's rubbish bins, that sort of thing available. They're pretty low risk because of that level of development there as well. Really high accessible, so that maybe there's wheelchair access, that sort of thing, but nicely paved areas but they can also be relatively noisy as well. So they might be close to main roads and traffic, that sort of thing. In the next category, we have back country. So that's just a little bit more off the beaten track than what we have with the front country. So the usage in those areas can still be relatively medium to high. There can still be some development. So maybe there, there are tracks there as well and perhaps some rubbish bins and maybe basic campsites, huts along the way. The risk level is increased from that which we see in the front country. And we have the accessibility is, is also a little bit lower. So it's you're not quite on the highway, for example. And there can, there can be less noise that you would expect in a backcountry area. From there, we step into remote areas and you see the use decreasing as well because it requires a higher level of skill to get into those areas. There's less and less development, increased levels of risk, less accessibility and usually quieter there as well. And then the last stage we have is wilderness, which is really a subset of remote, but it is even less, less usage. There, there should be no development there whatsoever, which is the main difference between remote and wilderness. We have increased levels of risk, very, very low accessibility, and you really shouldn't be hearing much noise there either, except potentially the others that you're traveling with. So conceptually, that's what these these areas look like. And what we wanted to do is to be able to see if we could use spatial data to be able to map these characteristics across New Zealand. So we took the conceptual information, thinking about remoteness, the size of areas that you might expect to experience there, whether there's evidence of humans, user density that we have from management data as well, and then also managerial regimentation. And then we linked those to information that we were able to map. So the proximity to motorized traffic. So if you remember, I spoke about front country was, you know, right on the on the tracks, the highways, that sort of thing. But size is a relatively easy thing to do. When we have spatial information, we can map areas. 
We wanted to know proximity to tracks and other infrastructure. Visitor numbers is something we have through, through our management data as well. And also the type of visitor group that experiences those, those opportunities or the infrastructure that we have in place there. And that's something that we're drawing from our managerial databases. So let's have a look at how that plays out when we start to build that into a geographic information system to map the experiences that we have across the country. So the first thing to note is that you'll see on the upper left hand side there is we have urban and rural areas. So we can, that's part of, of the recreation opportunity spectrum, but we take those immediately from land cover databases. So we don't need to map those out. So we've put that sort of slightly to the side. The, the four categories that we wanted to be able to derive using spatial information with front country, back country, remote and wilderness. And this is really all about those experiences that I, that I discussed on the previous slide. So thinking about how far away things are from each other, how quiet they are, all those sorts of things. So the spatial data that we had available to us are the roads and tracks. So we've got four-wheel drive roads, we've got highways, we've got sealed roads, two-wheel drive roads, et cetera. We also have the, the routes or the tramping tracks that you can see as the dotted lines on the map there. We have visitor numbers of so the people who are attending the campsites and, and huts, so you can see those there as well. And we put a, a characterization of how busy those places are as well. So, so a campsite or a hut that has less than 350 visitors is, is in one category versus one that has more than that, for example. We also had helicopter landing sites, and that's, that's really critical for thinking about noise to an area as well. So from here, it's all, all about really thinking about proximity to these, these characteristics that we have in landscape. So the first one that we did was to look at what we would call front country. And so this is really all about those highly accessible areas, really close to infrastructure. So that was really the closest area to these main roads and the third part of a track. So we're looking at 100 metres away from a road and then the first one and a half kilometres of a track. Also those areas where there were high use helicopter landing sites as well. So from there, we took another buffer out and grew that area, if you like. So we're now moving up to two kilometers away from the roads. And this area is what we're calling the back country. But then also those areas around the tracks and the four wheel drive roads there as well. So we've got levels of distance or proximity from these, from these features that we then include in the back country area. And you'll see the little buffers sitting around those lower use helicopter landing sites, as, as well as those visitor areas with the huts. So you'll see here that what we're really doing is using a buffer operation in a GIS to grow those areas out. And then once we work out what the back country is, then we can erase the front country from that. So we have those areas specific to that. From there, the next step was to basically color in everything up to 10 kilometers away from those main roads and then remove anything that wasn't front country or back country. So we're erasing those areas that we'd already classified and classify everything else in that mix. And that became our remote area. And then the area after that is our wilderness. So anything that's 10K away from these main roads and then really doesn't have any other infrastructure to taint it there as well. And so what happens when we get the, the data into a GIS, we then end up with sort of all these wiggly worms all over the country with areas that are classified in based on this proximity and, dip, and distance to features and infrastructure. And that's worked kind of well, but it looks a little bit wiggly. And what we wanted to do is make it conform to the landscape a little bit better. So it's a bit more understandable in, in terms of the topography that, that it's related to. So what we're doing here is then we started to look at the catchments or the, the, the sub-catchments, I guess, and then just sort of built out our model so that if, if we have something that is front country and we've got these little worms of areas around the tracks and the roads, then we just sort of build it out to influence the local catchment there as well. So just really thinking that, that we know we, we sort of respond a little bit more to the way the topography shapes the landscape as well, rather than hard lines that we draw on a map just purely based on proximity. So this gave it a little bit more of a natural feel. So when we look at the, what that turns out like, when you have a look at all of New Zealand, the gray areas are areas that are not that conservation estate. So the gray areas are 70% of New Zealand. We're really looking at that 30% that is the conservation estate. 
and classified into the urban, rural, front country, back country, remote and wilderness. So let's zoom in a little bit to the top of the South Island there to have a look at a little bit more of what that looks like. So you can see in the dark green area, we've got areas that are, that are looking at, um, at some remote areas. We've got some back country in, in amongst the squiggles here. We've got some yellow front country and some wilderness there as well. Now, one of the areas that's really interesting to talk about is, is wilderness and people's experience of this, because as for our model, you really only see true wilderness areas in the South Island of New Zealand. And so this is part of dealing with the visitor expectation when we communicate this information out, is that some people like to think that there's wilderness available to you near Auckland, near the major city there. And it might feel like that if you're really used to being in a big city and you wanna go a few kilometers away, and feel like you're having a wilderness experience, but it's nothing compared to the really far remote and potentially really risky areas that can, can, can be considered wilderness in the South Island. So for us, this was a challenge to think about how we communicate this to the public so they don't feel like they're losing wilderness in areas that are more busy, but that they really understand the risks associated with traveling in true wilderness areas. Now, the other thing that we had to contend with is that while this map will create areas that we see as wilderness, you'll see that there's also areas that are gazetted wilderness. And so th this is formalized. And you can see here on the map, we've got a red outline, which is an area of gazetted wilderness. And it doesn't actually align perfectly with what the model is saying. So we've got the dark green area being what the model is saying is wilderness. But actually, we've got gazetted wilderness here really abutting some of those more developed areas as well that we see in the front country. So we have choices here. So we, we can start to think, well, you know, do, do we want to build the area that the model is creating as wilderness? And do we want to fill that out into the gazetted wilderness area, for example? So to do that, we'd want to remove some of those front country and accessibility opportunities, and that would grow that area. But that's a management question to really think about how we deal with how we deal with the opportunities that we have available. So we took this, this analysis out to the, the conservancies in New Zealand, which are the areas that are responsible for parts of parts of the country, I guess, in a way, sort of like a state-based thing, and spoke to the, the, the recreation officers in each of those areas about how they can use this information. And the sorts of things that we're looking about is getting statistics on the, the area of these different opportunities and then within the conservancies, the lengths of tracks that they have to maintain, looking at the number and location of huts and campsites, and also the, the just the general number of different activities that they have in the spatial distribution of those as well. We started to look at the facilities analysis, and so looking at the lengths of different types of tracks in each of the conservancies. So on the x-axis you see there, we've got front country, back country, and remote areas. So remembering that wilderness shouldn't have any tracks in it, there shouldn't be any infrastructure there at all. And having a look at, at the categories of those different types of tracks as well. So New Zealand has these really wonderful cramping tracks that, that, they, that they use for New Zealanders, but also a lot of visitors that come over as well. And so we can start to look at, the, at how they're categorised and the length of each of those tracks as well. Do we want to make them longer? Do we want more of them? That kind of thing. We looked at the areas of coverage of each of the Royals categories for the different conservancies, and this, so this in particular is in the South Island. So on the x-axis here, we've got Nelson Marlborough is the first one, then we have Canterbury, West Coast, Otago, and Southland. And you can see they have, all have varying levels of different types of opportunities. So if you're really looking for a wilderness opportunity, you can head to Southland, which is the south of the South Island. And about 50% of their recreation opportunities are classed as wilderness. So it's really the place to go if you want to get away from everything. And so then we can start to look at the other conservancies and say, well, do we want more wilderness in, in those areas? Or perhaps in South, and do we need some more front country opportunities? So this is the way that we can start to use that spatial data that while it's been derived from a map, the map isn't necessarily the final output that we use for this analysis. So we've got some really great graphs here as well. So we can start then to look at integrating these data with other information that we have as well. And so look at landscape classifications through land cover and land use models. We can look at increased accessibility and how people get to different locations based on network analysis as opposed to just a proximity analysis. 
We're looking at different vegetation types, add in slope and elevation because that can increase risk and perhaps change your perception of where you are. And looking at how we do this in the country environments as well. So really the rod was developed just looking at land-based activities. But so how do we build that out and, and grow what we're doing in water-based activities as well? So we had a range of different ways in which we communicated this. We did, did workshops all around the country going to talk to each of the conservancies and the people who are managing the data and managing the facilities as well. We got feedback on how the model was working and then also used that to refine the model itself as well. So what I've presented to you is the final model, but there were various iterations in how we derived this as a GIS. And that, that process of evaluation and refining is really, really important. And for us, the key thing was really to communicate to the conservancies for management purposes and then allow them to be able to use that information to communicate outwards to the, to the general public and visitors as well about the types of risks associated in different, different areas and the facilities they might see across the country as well. But on top of that, we thought that it was a really good project to do and to describe the process and to be able to share that a little bit more broadly with the scientific public as well. So we did publish this, and so this is in a in a in a journal as a journal article. It is published, so it's, it was peer reviewed and widely available in scientific literature. Just as another means of communication, which is very different to the style that we used when we travelled around the country and 